nice to have you everyone here. Since I'm, I'm moderating, I get to set some rules. Yeah? <laughs> so one simple rule. Yeah? Uh, no homilies in apple pie. Yeah? So no saying, oh, customer centricity is the holy grail. Oh, humko sabko malum hai. Yeah? <laughs> also no saying, retailer and customers are, you know, cooperation. We know what is true, what is not true, we know what works. So such things which are obvious generalities, when if you say that, I don't have a yellow card, but I'll raise my hand and you need to stop mid-sentence there. Is that, is that all, is that fair? Yeah, yeah, okay. So what am I going to do? Again, is to use the fact that I get to trigger the questions. What I don't understand fully is the questions that I'm going to throw at you. And hopefully I will, I will, uh, I will get, to, get to learn a few things and all of us will also, also gain from there. So uh, Hardeep and Asta, so I'll start with you. And anybody can, anybody can come in. This is, this is a freewheeling uh, thing. As long as we don't use homilies in what we say, uh, uh, instant shopping of groceries happening. Digital is the, the buzzword. What always intrigues me is what gets bought in physical stores, what gets bought in uh, digital stores, uh, what gets bought in a planned manner, what gets bought in an, at an instant or an impulse. Is there a pattern here? Is there is there anything that uh, uh, you guys can add value to? Can you also add who along with what? Can you also add who along with Absolutely. what? Absolutely, correct. Yeah, so please do. Uh, let's have uh, Hardeep start the conversation. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Hans. Uh, I agree with you, Damodarji. Uh, possibly the most underestimated potential in, in, in any kind of retail is the, this whole world of impulse shopping, especially impulse grocery. You know, we have brought it to a point where impulse to most of us still means putting gums and candies around pause. The world is very big around impulse and I'll just share a few, uh, still early days for us, uh, early days for me, I'm, you know, I'm still a student of retail, but uh, here's what I have picked up, uh, you know, operating 7-Eleven stores in Mumbai last 12, 14 months. Uh, I think let me start with the, how you explain the theater of dream and the swimmer. Uh I think the first problem lies in the way we have de defined the swimmer of impulse grocery. Uh, it's always seen in silos. And to quote the Swember example, it's like no intercaste marriage allowed. The moment we open the thing to studying interplays between categories, equivalent to intercaste marriage in a Swember, this whole world of impulse starts to implode. Uh, to quote few examples, for example, you know, one of the most bought combination of impulse in, in, in our stores in Mumbai is a sandwich with a cold coffee tetra pack. Now in our silos of category definition, companies definition, they, the two sit in two different communities, categories, castes. But we never understand that in impulse, in that moment, that dating can happen between any two categories, and that's where impulse starts to implode. Uh, another example would be one of the most bought product is the, the, the famous Vada Pav. And what goes best with Vada Pav? A can of Coke, aside from a cutting chai, and so on and so forth. So I think the first, uh, we all are guilty of still being in the category silos and not understanding the, the, the sheer possibilities that the interplay can bring in this world of impulse grocery. The second is also the way we have designed and defined our formats. It's still taking a lot of effort, I would, you know, this is more a, a confession, that we call it, oh, big box means monthly destination, oh, small box means weekly, weekly shopping destination. So if you just step back, we are looking at this whole world from frequency of shopping. Just for a moment, change this definition to frequency of consumption. For example, you know, look at 
a typical, let's say, a day in life of a customer, or our own life. In the last three hours that I have been around, I have sipped much more than I have snacked, and I have snacked much more than I had a meal. Now when you look at impulse, what do we put up around a pause? The gums, the candies, and the jellies. Where are the beverages? If my, you just picked up a beverage, by the way. <laughs> so my interaction with beverage, a water, a chai, a coffee, a juice, a, 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 a soda drink, is so high, but we have never looked at this whole space of impulse from frequency of consumption. Uh, always guilty of looking at it from frequency of shopping. The two are very different. Specific to products, uh, which are, you know, again, early days, still learning. I'm go going to use a word, uh, so, you know, sin foods. Or let me use a, you know, let me be politically right, the guilt, guilt uh, eating. And the safest example would be sweets, the craving for sweet. No surprise in a format which is built around impulse, a convenience format like a 7-Eleven and few more, the share of confectionery, desserts, ice creams, soft, soft teas. It's a, it's a different world altogether because at home, we all have Lakshman Rekha drawn, whether it is a consumption of sweet in some houses, non-vegetarian food, so on and so forth. But let that swimmer happen in a convenience store it starts to, you know, there are no boundaries. And the biggest uh, beneficiary of this is how some of these guilt food start to implode. Last, I think, uh, a thing which really it still continues to surprise us is uh, the whole area of gifting. Uh, in fact, one year back, we were just two stores and just happened to put uh, around Christmas time, this time of the year, and we just happened to put few store assembled hampers. And before we realized, they were gone. And we are a convenience store, and by the way, it's not a popular product or a, it's not part of a, the 7-Eleven international portfolio. And next, few more days, a few days later, we again put up another hamper, gone. So, one more area from the product side is the whole area of gifting. More than planned gifting, I think it's gone into, call it guilt gifting, impulse gifting, last minute choice. So I think, again, coming back, the, the world of opportunities is, is so big in impulse grocery that we are all guilty of underestimating it uh, and, and restrict, restricting it to you know, some very a corner around pause. I think it deserves a much bigger place. So I'll take a step back. Uh, this entire panel is about what the modern millennial and Gen Z consumer is consuming and what are their changing habits. And I'm guilty of being one of uh, you know the millennials uh, uh, and representing the population. And uh, having traveled abroad, lived abroad, uh, I used to be frustrated. Uh, you know, in my early startup days, uh, ad hoc workers, nuclear families, uh, I'm working, my husband's working, uh, we're all busy. Uh, why is there no convenience store chain in India? Uh, you know, in the US, we were used to shopping at 7-Eleven, in Indonesia, at Indomart, Family Mart, Carrefour. I mean, there's just so many of, it's a trillion dollar global industry. And why, when India is the youngest population in the world, this format is just not setting, uh, setting a foot here. Um, so, uh, you know, we all decided, me and my other two co-founders, that um, rather than waiting, uh, let's just uh, build India's convenience retail brand for the world. We're very patriotic and very nationalist and uh, tired of building inter international brands in India. We wanted to build an Indian brand for the world. Um, and interestingly, the convenience retail format is what is driven by the millennial and the Gen Z population. So, uh, pretty much every every product and service uh, uh, that is consumed within the first one hour of purchase, it's what's sold at a convenience store. Um, and it's an entire gamut. I think anything and everything that's sold at a convenience store, I would define as impulse purchase. Um, the two kinds of impulse purchases, uh, number one is you know anything that's consumed within the first one hour. Um, and uh, we sell both products and services um, like instant cash. We, we are the first convenience store chain uh, that launched instant cash pickups, right? Uh, you could just pay 
pay through UPI, and uh, what we realize is that 5,000 rupees is, a, is, is the amount of money that people would rather get home delivered or pick up at a convenience store than take a drive to the nearest ATM where they'll be spending a lot more money on fuel and, and time and energy. So, uh, uh, you know, this is a format that is driven by impulse purchases. Um, and in that, one is obviously what's consumed immediately. And the other large section is that while you're there in the store, or if you're using our app, or if you are using us or browsing uh, the new shop at any of our, uh, uh, we're omni-channel, so we're uh, available across 12 channels. Um, the, the one thing that people see is that, okay, I wanted this, but this also looks fascinating, I also want to buy that. And here I'd like to quote Mr. Damodar when he said, customers want new. And I'm glad we called ourselves a new shop. Because the millennial and Gen Z customer, when they're browsing for things that they need to be consumed within the first one hour, they also stumble upon new and exciting products, uh, which for us is a very large driving category, which is D2C brands. Um, and, and it's just, uh, voila, I can't find it anywhere else. Uh, I'm finding it at the new shop. And uh, that's now, uh, that's the mind space we're, we're, uh, we're, we're capturing in the consumer's mindset that they're most likely to find at every trip of there something new, cool, and exciting at the new shop. So um, that's basically our understanding of, uh, we also have a very interesting uh, affinity analytics. Um, two of the most commonly sold products at our stores, and I also have somebody from ITC sitting here, is cigarettes and Kit Kat. Um, and this is a very unlikely analysis because uh, even when we saw our inf affinity analytics data, we were super shocked that why would, that not be a center fresh or a Mentos along with a cigarette. Why a Kit Kat? And uh, that's where product placement plays a big role. So about 20% of our customers, when they're coming to shop, and this is all millennials and Z, um, are coming with children, or it's women shoppers to answer the who of that. Uh, whenever they're at the store um, and they're coming to buy cigarettes, and now there's a very large population of uh, cigarette consumption among women who'd rather eat a sweet after the cigarette consumption than eat, um, eat a chewing gum. Um, also, when there are fathers who are bringing their kids to the stores, uh, what they see is um, you know, the, the Kit Kat and the chocolates are placed right at the POS, and the cigarettes um, are placed behind, um, uh, behind the cashier, uh, you know, above the eye level because we don't want children to see cigarettes. But while fathers are there buying their favorite pack of cigarettes, uh, their kids see the Kit Kat and pick it up. So um, these are some cool examples of uh, uh, data that we have seen and um, excited about more learnings. Uh, uh, we wanted to grow very fast. Uh, we're a startup. And uh, there, there are great examples in front of us. Uh, there are close to about 30 um, convenience store chains that are all doing billion dollars of revenue. So a lot of learnings came to us from them. And uh, we wanted to truly solve this problem. So we scaled rapidly over the last 18 months. We're at close to about 100 stores now. Um, and uh, learning every day, making a lot of mistakes, but also correcting our mistakes and learning quickly. But the one thing that we have seen is um, uh, having spread across tier one cities, tier two cities, and now non-urban cities as well, the customer, the millennial and the Gen Z customer, uh, is getting more and more aspirational, and they have uh, the same kind of uh, needs um, as, as anywhere in any part of the world, thanks to access to TikTok, Instagram, and various other social media platforms. So. Constantly learning, evolving, and uh, knowing that um, impulse is what drives the new age customer who's like me, who doesn't have time, and uh, building a format that exactly marries that uh, mindset of the customer. Uh, sir, if I can just come in, one addition to this, uh, with your permission. Uh, I, uh, our experience, because we operate right from Atta to biscuits, to noodles, to juices, to frozen, or chocolates, has been that your question on plan versus impulse. It's actually very confusing because we find that we launch a new ghee, we're getting very good uh, uh, purchase and uh, business, for example, on quick commerce. So I think that a lot of those boundaries, as you kindly spoke about in your session, are actually good. We were surprised how much ATA we sell on an unplanned channel like a quick commerce. So I guess the answer is not very clear. No, very valid point you make. I think all consumption is multi category. I think that's the way you're looking at it. And uh, people increasingly want things uh, uh, accessed. Uh, and there is no such thing as uh, uh, a clear divide between planned and uh, impulse, you say. Only one thing I don't agree as in, uh, with you, a little difference of opinion from the old school. I think conveniently shopping for groceries in India is probably best served compared to most parts of the world. 
in many cases, you don't even have to get out of your pajamas, just walk uh, downstairs from your from your uh, your apartment, and you have a you have a an entrepreneur run store that uh, does it. Modernization we all need to yes. do, and modernize modernize offering we all need to do. The but customer now wants uh, 100x the experience that they were used to, I, I, and I, the standardization thanks to COVID because hygiene and standardization, which wasn't uh, something that was occupying a customer's mindset, now has become priority. So we've seen blue collar guys as well as uh, the white collar guys coming to our stores and uh, expecting the same kind of experience uh, of standardization and hygiene. So switching gear and you know, uh, to the now the product guys, I, I would say. Uh, uh, See, we are seeing here displayed at the, at the stalls uh, a very vast range of products, yeah? from, from mix for Bedmi Pudi and Poha to uh, 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 vitaminized water uh, is, is what, we, what we see. So, from, uh, so me, the retailer, and a uh, uh, small retailer with a national footprint like Reliance, Always, what do I pry? What is the bigger opportunity? The opportunity to uh, democratize and make accessible uh, things that are already popular, or the opportunity to premiumize and introduce new categories. What would what would one choose? Any any thoughts on how you guys think about it? Okay, I'll take a bash at it. I think there is no either or, and I think here it is. There is on one hand. Packaged food itself at 10% penetration, the awareness of these brands that are there in packaged foods is well over 45-50%. So there is a part of people who have converted. There's a big difference in urban versus rural penetration. And if one applies the lens of lifetime value of consumer, there's enormous scope to get more users onto core categories by really going deep down and educating on the benefits of our products. And that ranges across packaged foods because we're really nascent as a business. And that really caters to what one would say India 2, uh, India 3, and rural and small towns. Equally, there is the average of 10% hides the fact that when you look at different consumer courts, there's a set which is sitting at 25-30%, which has got used to what is being offered and expects something different and something more. And therefore, given the size of our country, taking one average and working doesn't make sense. And hence, as long as there is one side of the country which is sitting at 30, 40 penetration, premiumization is a great, great opportunity to grow because the core categories the consumers are really used to. So to me, both have equal headrooms of growth. One needs a longer term investment, but you get more loyalty and reward in the long term. The other entry is easier but scaling up can be difficult. So they come with their challenges, but I think there's opportunity both ends to grow. And which is what, when you started, you said we can grow for another generation because we can offer the choice. The choice can be more premium, and the choice can be presence of a choice as physical and e-com both grow to consumers who wanted it but can't access it. And that, you guys are breaking boundaries. So to me, both is there to win. Yeah, I think I'll, I'll build on what Tan just said. Uh, clearly, there is the premium end of the market which will continue to grow and probably outgrow the rest of the market. You know, the demographics will lead us there. Today, about 30% of our consuming households are, you know, what we call SEC ABC, which is middle class and above. Uh, touch wood, the way India is going, uh, by 2028, that will be almost 50% of households. So the premium end, because consumers are in the end going to have more disposable income in their hands, is going to outgrow the rest. Uh, but to completely agree, uh, India will have opportunities wherever you look and whatever model you'd like to find. You want to go with a full portfolio, top, middle, bottom, which a lot of big brands do. There will be success to be found there. You want to go specific, you will find opportunities over there because the opportunity is just so big. If I take categories that I'm currently working on, like breakfast cereal, the penetration is still, I would say, very low. And therefore, there is always going to be a need to make it more relevant, to democratize, and to take it wider. At the same time, we are seeing the top end of the market actually grow the fastest. And therefore, muesli, granola, many things that we are introducing are outgrowing the rest of the categories by a mile. So you will always have this opportunity of doing both. The question is, can you find the models that work 
both for retailers as well as for brand producers. Um, yeah, I would uh, you know just like to supplement what you just said. So um, I run a startup called OTP, which is in the fruits and vegetable supply chain. So it's a 12-hour farm to fork. Uh, what we play on a lot is freshness. And uh, along the way, we reduce wastages quite a bit. Uh, you know, like conventional supply chain sees 35%, you know, we see like 4%. So that is, uh, you know, 30, 31% savings in wastages. And uh, so like in NCR, we move about, you know, 110, 120 tons every day. So that is about, you know, 30 to 40 tons of food wastage we save every day. Now, uh, see, given that it's a fast supply chain, it works very well for perishables. And uh, you know, just to add to your point, we have actually, you know, I would just say that uh, there is actually a market for both. You know, we see that in some cases, you know, talking about perishable category, let's talk about you know batter, for example. So we sell sell a lot of uh, idli dosa batter on our platform, and you know, we actually saw in certain cases that uh, where you know the price point was maybe a little bit above the you know the lowest one, but the volumes that that particular item sold was actually way bigger than you know even the lowest price one and then on the contrary somehow if you look at uh, you know in the fruits and vegetables category we see that you know sometimes it is the premium sq which actually takes up a larger market share but broadly what i see is that you know the consumer in india is very smart you know he is very easily able to calculate the value that i'm getting for my money and uh, overall we see a market for both you know there is a segment of, I would say, the you know the more affluent consumers, which is growing, which is a big market. But at the same time, we have a whole big long tail of uh, consumers at the bottom of the pyramid as well, who have a uh, you know a need where you know just a lower price point can can solve a value uh, for them as well. I just wanted to add one point here. Tan was right that for a large manufacturer, both are available. But it's also interesting because Mr. Mull said we should be frank with each other. But the reality is that I'm so happy to see a lot of new age companies, startups there. Because large companies, supply chains are not as agile or innovation uh, funnels as small companies. So honestly speaking, I think a lot of large companies, they actually struggle to be as agile from a supply chain perspective and product crafting innovation perspective as the startups which we are seeing today. So you know, that is always the dilemma in a large company like uh, maybe Aurora. So as you will all notice, I'm getting some answers, but I'm getting some questions put back and saying, dono bhi ho sakta hai. you know, you have to do, there is no, there is no simple simplification of that kind. So here is a, here is a uh, different tack of question. I am a startup, I am a product startup. I've, I've got a great idea. Uh, it connects with the customers. In this new world, and this uh, anybody can take on. In this new world, uh, is, it, is it possible for me to uh, continue to flourish as completely D2C and get by with no distribution, no bypassing the physical retail altogether? Is it possible for me to be successful? Is it possible for me to? Flourish and saying, yeah, 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 uh, uh, nahi hai, talking to the supermarket walas. Oh, yeah, OTP. Aap pata hai. Yeah, I mean, see, um, when I uh, look at the market today, so, um, I mean, as a brand, see, a lot of opportunities have opened up, right, with, you know, e-commerce uh, creating a way, then, you know, with the quick commerce, which is like, you know, 10, 15 minute delivery. So I think, uh, and if you look at the increasing trends, you know, there are brands that are being built just on e-commerce, like the other day, um, I don't rec recall the name, but there was a brand which had showed up on Shark Tank, and just and they were not available on any physical, actually medium at all, and uh, uh, you know they were just selling on digital, and you know their sales like immediately skyrocketed after the the Shark Tank episode. Um, so coming to my point, I think uh, uh, as a brand. The opportunities have never been better because you know there are players like us who are constantly scouting for you know newer products to sell and which we can entice to the consumer. And the advantage that we have is that we don't have to like physically stock you know a lot of them you know just in one warehouse and we can get things moving. 
So I think there are, and modern retail also creates another opportunity where they can quickly, you know, get it across. While GT, I think, is the hardest, although it has the biggest reach. But I think, uh, you know, for a young brand, I think the, you know, the times have never been better. And I think they'll, you know, only get better from here onwards. That's what I feel. Slightly different so, point so of view. For, from, from levers, I'm saying the whole distribution, poof. And you do a flyover direct to the consumer. Is that is that is that uh, dreaming or is that a way to succeed so in the market? I, I don't think there is one model or the other. The simple answer is with more avenues coming in on e-com or modern trade stores, a brand is now able to scale up to about 70 to 100 crores. But if you then talk about from that level to get, so if you take for example in our country, there are not many thousand crore brands that exist purely digitally. So there is a certain point in time when you take some of the most celebrated cases on built by e-commerce, they're currently very aggressive in the physical store to make their presence. And I think that happens because even if you take across categories, for us, for the country, distribution trade is well over 70% of the business. So the multiplier to just get physical reach of a very successful brand, which is important for the next wave of users, it starts making its presence felt when you touch the 100 crore. And I think over two decades earlier, brands struggled to scale up beyond 25, 30 crores. The 25 has moved to 100, but beyond 100, our experience of what's happening around, you do see the need to go well beyond not just modern trade stores, but also GT. And that, I think, is where the balance comes. Thankfully, so, it's not poof from our so share price, so we're sorted. Interrupting, but I get a number from you, which is very good. And this is for everybody. So if if 70, 100 crore means success to you, then you can get by get by uh, simplifying your model and going direct to uh, consumer. But if you want to address the fuller market, then you have to... Uh, uh, can I the, add something there? Yes, please. Um, because we, as a young startup, uh, we work with all D2C brands. And um, uh, that 100 crore is actually the right number, but not every brand even gets there. Because it involves a very high customer acquisition cost if you're purely e-commerce, and then migrating from a purely e-commerce brand to offline is even a bigger challenge. So uh, I'm sure everyone knows here, but the FMCG industry in India is a $740 billion industry, and e-commerce will become 3% of that by 2025. So the larger pie actually lies uh, in offline, and offline cannot be ignored, and a lot of D2C brands we work with have made that uh, big blunder of not planning to go omni-channel from day one, and they're actually struggling uh, big time, uh, now trying to occupy customer mind space. And the real test of a brand success is actually when they come online, uh, sorry, uh, when they go offline. Uh, they've not gotten their packaging right. Uh, you know, If you're on Amazon, or if you are uh, running your own e-commerce website, your packaging could be anything. But when you actually enter the offline space and you are battling against um, you know, a Dabur or an ITC or an HUL products, uh, and you don't have the packaging attractive enough, uh, the customer will completely ignore it. In fact, not even see you because the customer is used to a certain kind of a brand. So um, that's what we have realized that uh, 50 crores probably is still a number that people can get to, but then they're still burning money because they've spent a lot of money on customer acquisition costs. They've still not hit profitability, even if they're at a 50 crore or even a 100 crore revenue. They have to invest in an omni-channel kind of a distribution to really create a strong brand presence that we're talking about. No, I think uh, uh, excellent point. The, the fact that there is an opportunity to go up to 50 crore, I'm talking about this, it's a little bit of but wo, go up to that wo, level VC and money succeed, burn. succeed with the That's after burning today. a lot of VC money. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. So a last question, and I'm, here I will touch uh, another uh, uh, holy, holy uh, motherhood and apple pie thing, which gets spoken about uh, at conferences like this. Uh, is it a myth or a reality? The word that gets tossed around maximum is a word called omni-channel. Yeah. Is it like a you know a mythical creature that uh, one business and one culture, one organization can be both uh, uh, digital and physical led uh, simultaneously? Or in our experience, learning, in our thought, we believe that uh, there is genetically physical 
organizations and teams and cultures, and that is genetically a digital organization. Does this does Omni Channel happen, or is it a chimera that uh, gets spoken about more here, not in the not in the marketplace? So, uh, sir, obviously, like I take a company like ITC, which is primarily a tobacco or a Atta biscuit company, and maybe we service 45 million outlets on a weekly basis. So, obviously, it is a challenge to change your mindsets. It is a challenge to craft, as I mentioned, supply chains. Because you are used to sending a truckload of Atta uh, to, a, to a distributor, and then you are talking about changing the entire marketing value chain, manufacturing agility, etc. You are right that the need for agility is there when you have a success or whatever built on a certain value chain. Having said that, I mentioned that uh, companies like us, I think it is Euros to the startups here, that we get challenged and we learn from them. And I think that is where the power of learning is, that there are certain things that, are, that a company which has built on a value chain, which is mass marketing has, and there are certain things that need to be developed. Uh, but I think that uh, if I look at especially the younger part of our, uh, let's say, employee base, the youngsters who are, uh, I think those are the people who are actually teaching us that how to look at digital marketing, how to look at D2C. So I think the entire ecosystem is coming together, but you are right that when we start thinking, we think ki ek TVC banana hai. TVC ko chalayenge and work will be done. So you're right, there is a mindset and that is changing over time. So just to compliment one, it is not a PowerPoint, it's reality. And the reason I say it is let's put the shopper or the customer, like you started the session with your address around the Swayam so let's put her in the center. In the days when she was shopping just from the neighborhood, she saw great ambience of modern trade. She never left the neighborhood. She started shopping in both. Then, when various circumstances, COVID being one part, etc., she thought it is safer to order online. She still didn't leave the modern trade store, and neither did she leave the general trade store. So she is finding, depending on her time and what is easy for her to browse and pick up, she's using all of them, which is truly omnichannel. So for sure, not a PowerPoint slide happening in reality, making life more difficult to get products discovered. But that's where she is, that's how she's going, and therefore we'll all follow it. I, I, I would agree with Tan. You know, I think this, uh, whatever data analysis we do of our customer database, one day the same customer is in the store, next day the same customer is asking for home delivery. Uh, both, both are going to coexist. What you have to ensure is your product and service experience is consistent regardless of channel. Uh, and there, that's where those hard choices, prudent choices come in play. It's not about opening too many offline stores or, or going you know, berserk on the servicing radius. Draw a line such that your product and service experience is consist consistent and good, regardless of channel that you're in. So we are, the new shop is an omni-channel chain and planned for it, uh, we were COVID babies. We launched in 2020 and uh, the reason why we've grown so fast is because we thought omni-channel from day one and there's something that we've observed. Offline presence will give you a strong, strong foundation to get your supply chain, customer access, everything in one go. But e-commerce, uh, being online present, will give you the scale, right? So uh, what we realized is, um, you know, after our 55 stores, we launched our own app, and uh, we reached 100,000 app downloads without a single rupee spent on marketing. Uh, and it's the same customer who has been our loyal customer base and uh, wants to order from us through all channels. Having said that, we didn't restrict ourselves to just our own app uh, for instant commerce, uh, our own stores and facilitation of uh, online to offline between both the mediums. But we're also present across each and every channel that a customer is present at, right? Customers want flexibility. So whether it's a magic pin, it's a Zomato, it's a Dunzo, we are everywhere. You know, We want to serve our customer and we're agnostic about which channel the customer wants to be served at. And you'll see the customer's mind space is so well, well occupied uh, by the new shop that um, you know they kind of like take it for granted. They want to be served by the new shop everywhere. And um, if you if you are able to crack that seamless integration, and obviously you need to have like superb technology and takes time to build. 
but that's what you need um, and that is the future it's 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 not a myth or reality it's the present and it is the future and uh, customers would want seamless interactions and uh, whether it is today in the current world or even if it is the new metaverse or uh, you know the new internet um, you have to be present everywhere that the customer is present and have to be completely uh, accepting of the flexibility that the customer wants so there are there are there are two notes that i take from this there is no such thing as uh, an e-commerce customer or a kirana customer or a supermarket customer there is a there is an e-commerce occasion in the life of the same customer and there is a supermarket uh, occasion in the life of the customer the second one which is a little more personal the youngest member of the panel uh, made two points which said offline stores matter yeah thankfully i will keep my job for another few years <laughs> and we'll be successful thank you very much and lovely talking to you